this is strange on the talk. I've got no theorems. <laughs> it's got no experiments. It's got no movies. <laughs> so it's like AI talk. I know it's happened. So I've been worrying about uh, automated vehicles for many years.
just one important point about vision zero out of all that stuff, lower speed is really the most important safety thing. Yeah? What does a zero refer to? Say it again? The zero in vision zero. Next one would be one. Vision zero. <laughs> zero is you're supposed to read zero fatalities. <laughs> zero serious accidents, zero fatalities. <laughs> I mean, the movement started in Sweden or somewhere in Scandinavia, and then it has slowly gone south and reached our shores here. Speed versus risk of death, right? So you get hit by a car, what's the chance of you getting killed? If you get hit tw below 20 miles per hour, chances are 5% that you'll get killed. If you get hit at 40%, the chances of death are 85%. So if you cut down the speed, you really cut down the power. Pedestrian deaths have been chronic since 2009, which a lot of shows. That's become a bigger and bigger burden, a bigger and bigger problem. And as more and more people are bicycling right, and walking, it's called now there's a new term called active transportation. Active transportation means you're using your muscles <laughs> whether it's walking or cycling. So active transportation, you might say, causes more deaths. So that's the most important thing. But that requires enforcement, and we just do not enforce speed in this country. Let's go to automated vehicles. That's all I'm going to talk about vision zero, unless there's some questions. So automated vehicles, you can call it the promise or the hype, depending on how you think about it. So the first one is from Waymo. Waymo, as you know, is the new name for the Google automated vehicles. So you always find these numbers. Every year, 1.2 million lives are lost. Here, Motors said 1.25 million lives are lost. The same story. 94% of our women are women are 94%. So basically, they're going to eliminate 94% of accidents caused by human error. That's the big promise of having the vehicles. I should say that the 94% is a misleading number. You always quote the same paper. And you go to the paper itself, which is from NHTSA, the report based on 2005 2007 data, it states specifically, I'm quoting, in none of these cases was the assignment intended to blame the driver for causing the crash. They start out with a model in which you have three possible causes environment, lightning, thunder, rain, etc., car failure, and the third is a default driver. There's very few environmental issues, very few car failures. 94% of them accrue by definition to the right. right? It's not saying this driver uh, did X, Y, Z, stupid things, and that's what I call it the accident. But that's the impression you get by looking at the. There are two people involved, there's also the other person. And the pedestrian group. Yes, yes. Why not in the driver? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. So that the, the, the point about 94%, which is touted, is completely mistaken. Not an actual cause effect relationship. The driver of the state, the driver of the bad judgment. Anyway. The third one is the most of that GM and, 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 and Waymo was established now. The third one is the latest entry into our main Intel. Intel bought this company called Mobile Life, which is $50 and they're supposed to, according to the CEO of Mobile Life, how do you do the chief of the terrified of transfer? thousand times safety improvement. Yeah. They don't have a single automated vehicle yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is promise. Yeah. Okay. So that's all. Let's go. Let me just introduction to connected and automated vehicles. So it's kind of interesting. Connected vehicles. So connected vehicle means that you have a radio communication link between the vehicle and either a Structure or the cloud or pedestrian or other computers. So we get C to V, cloud to vehicle, V to V, vehicle to infrastructure, and all these activities, V to access. The connection may be one way or two way, and there's a variety of communication uh, here. ESRC is, is, is a direct short range communication. That's the one that about the transformation of the 
Nintendo Nerd Group now is a big thing, 5G. 5G, 7G. Bluetooth is still very, very useful. GPS is essential in all of these applications, but it is frequently not accurate enough for certain purposes. GPS by itself is not going to be able to help with something in the next lane or in the next lane or on the other side. Globalization is a very important issue. Automated vehicles, on the other hand, are not connected. They don't use what you call the current wave term operator. The sensors and computers automate driving tasks and level zero to five. SAE has five, six, level to zero, six, level to violation, and level three, four, and five. So level three, which is what most of automated vehicles today offer. So if the driver uses the vehicle to pull control for critical tasks, such as steering and accelerating, under certain conditions, but returns the control, the vehicle returns the control to the driver when it gets in the situation. So that's level three. Level four is the next operation. Self-driving vehicle does not require the driver to do anything at all, but it operates in a certain specified domain. The specified domain is geographic, traffic conditions, lighting conditions, etc. and so forth, all these operational domains. That's the which Level five is what you think about operating people. It's fully automated. You can just call it, and then you can attempt to park, you can pick you up, you can go get your grocery, etc. Today's 80s are not connected, and they are not connected. And many, many connected vehicles are not automated. Many, many connected. So many, increasingly, more and more vehicles are getting connected. Right. So with 4G, whether you know it or not, but your car likely is sending reports to the manufacturer without the right? condition of your engine, condition of your fuel, etc. So, so they are all connected. At this stage, they're not sending you back to change your engine or fuel map and stuff like that. There, there's a big worry about security and hacking, right? So if your car is exposed, then somebody can convert it to a Ferrari or take a Ferrari and convert it into something else. <laughs> So that's, that's a problem, but that will happen as soon as the issue is solved. But anyway, right now, so connection, connected vehicles are quite few. But the over the air, so called OTA, sending reports of your engine condition and so on, that's not good enough because the senator, is, the latency is just not enough to, to be involved in actual driving decisions. So that is not a Skeptics. The first one says functional safety is impossible to enforce in complex Only a few use cases can be addressed with good values. The next last sentence is important. You must get rid of the safety driver, otherwise there is no business case. So today, if you want to get if you have a level three car vehicle and you want to get permission from the department of Montana in California to testing, you must have a safety driver. Well, you cannot run a taxi business with a safety driver. Right? So, so that's an important point. This guy, Kevin, he's the CEO of EasyMod. EasyMod is a van company, which in some limited environments has a lot of many vehicles. So wait, many of them have these limited environments, how many people, like you know, the airport or the campus or something like that. But that's not a business. We need that to make money. The second bullet is surprising. That's why the CEO Patrick off way more. So five or six years ago, I, I didn't get a quote from Larry. He said, in five years, you'll see automated vehicles on the street. This is a success of Larry. Five years later. It's only decades for self-driving vehicles in the common roads. And the last thing, it may never change. It will not be able to drive itself. So these are skeptics. The third one is Waymo does its testing in uh, So this is the corner one goes down. Maybe it was driving there. 
she nearly hit the way more time to the left. Got it stopped abruptly in the middle of the intersection. Go, I shouted at her. And it says the Waymo van frequently stopped in the middle of the intersection, trying to figure out what to do. Go. <laughs> and up to three seconds. I mean, that's a lot. So, it's a known problem. Now, let's look at the safety record. I'm going high, and then we'll have to listen to the safety record. So, <clears throat> the accident rate for our main vehicles is So that's 40,000 miles per accident, mostly minor rear rates. Waymo's rate, which is 5,500 miles per self-reported ticket, this is the only statistic that is useful that you get from um, So what is a disengagement? This is a quote from the California DMV that disengagement occurs when the failure of the autonomous technology is or the safety driver thing situation Danger, so I'm going to disengage from automatic So that rate is about five for way more, five and a half thousand miles. Maybe five and a half thousand miles. Automatic system is disengaged. The US rate for accidents is five hundred thousand miles per accident. So the way more accident rate is 13 times worse than the and the disengagement rate is 100 times worse. Think about disengagement as a precursor to an accident in the time So safety record today, I mean, things are improving, but there's a long way to go to get back to So how do automated vehicles work? Sense plan for all of them. Waymo, Google, AI, or whatever system. Sense is you can use LIDAR, radar, and cameras. Detect and classify all the objects in the picture of Waymo. Classify all the objects around the room, test the position of speed, and prediction. Prediction is difficult. But they all have some model and they do prediction of all the <coughs> when I say predict of all the objects they, they pass by the objects in the so-called stationary stationary objects they don't try to predict. Right? How you decide whether the car is stuck or is moving and stop is a different issue. And usually they have a sort of funnel of possible movements of these other objects for the next five to ten seconds. And now you plan your trajectory to avoid getting That's the second part of the planning, to avoid running into the place. And then the third part is now you actually uh, actuate a plan, it's going more to stay the engine or stay the car, it's to decide what you tell us in this case. That's what the problem. I'll go to this one particular crash. Which took place, and that's what happens to be a good deal. Everything else happens to be a good deal. March 24, 2017. This is a police report. The Uber vehicle, so there's one, two, three, four lanes. Uh, north and south. The Uber vehicle is in the last lane. Regular vehicle being driven on the other side, taking the left turn. This vehicle is going straight. These two, the next lanes are blocked, but there is a saturation. So these two vehicles are blocked. So the Ubers over here cannot see this vehicle. But by the straight line, this the light just turned yellow when the Google vehicle enters. And then it's 40, about 40 miles an hour flow. It's only in Arizona. I know it's actually about that. It's speed. In Arizona, it's 40 miles an hour flow. And it's traveling at 38 miles per hour. Yeah. 
hits this bar, flips on the side, slides across, and hits two other bars. Okay. Police report says that is this driver's fault. But in accidents, fault does not mean much. Right? If you have a car between traffic train and school, it's not successful. Both sides are going to get liability. If the 80, 20, 50, 50, 20, 80, but both sides are responsible. But in this case, this person is responsible because she, there's nothing she could have done. You have to have the road as clear as making the person left her before we left. She said she saw you, so let's see what she said. So there are four lessons from this crash. Spatial and temporal uncertainty. First one is that Uber did not make that when it entered the intersection with Second, it did not know and the traffic on the opposite side could take a left turn right in front of you. If all you see is a red or a green or yellow, you don't know what the other party or the other approach, what kind of what kind of right away they have. Is there a left you Pardon me? Is there any left you go? That lady? I don't know whether she did or not. Does there go a man in front of you? Yeah, so I don't know whether she did or not, but any of this, this it's an exclusive, I mean, it's a left turn lane she's in, right? Okay, so, not no. Uber driver, as you'd say, Uber safety operator, says she, he saw the one on the two lane to get, as traffic in the first two lanes had created blind spots. So, what they had to bring the Honda on that one, you can see the car. The Honda drivers, well, Bob had crossed the third lane. She crossed the first two lanes, and Bob the third lane, and then saw a car flying from the intersection. <laughs> 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 he couldn't stop and come in. And then, for him, as driver, it's impossible to stop. So, then he could stop. So, the crash could have been predicted by phase prediction. That if the Uber knew that in two seconds the tide is going to turn red, it could have slowed down. And he also could have been told that the opposite side has a left and this is left. She could have provided a blind spot information to Cooper saying that there is a there is a left turn angle which is up to the And similarly could have provided a blind spot information to Honda that there's a car coming on the opposite side. So this spatial and temporal uncertainty can be moved by information from the intersection. The intersection knows that there's a what turns are permitted and what turns are not permitted, knows when the sign light is going to change, so could have provided a concession, how to provide it, and so on. So that's going to come. I'll give you just examples of six other common crash intersections. This one is not the <coughs> turning right on red. She's going to go into this Two other. This one could they have a permission to go left and end up in the same way. And that green vehicle also may have a permission to go to. Right? So all these three vehicles may think that they can go to the same way. So conflict. This vehicle is making a right on green. And there is a pedestrian that cannot take maybe a couple of seconds to decide whether it's pedestrian is going that way or going that way. So when is it safe to make the turn? So the California and other law is if there's a pedestrian anywhere in that cross section, it's supposed to stop. Nobody follows that. Hmm. Yeah. Just one point about the speed enforcement and this enforcement. There's no enforcement mechanism. Every crosswalk is not going to have some reason to decide so many of these laws are well-meaning, but then people become cynical. This is another common thing, red light violation. This vehicle sees it's green, but thinks it's going to turn yellow, and then doesn't realize whether this one will stop with the yellow or not, so thinks it just 
was the following team in session, and that's very common in the rear end. <coughs> this one wants to turn left, but because of, you cannot see this thing. This is a common day in Berkeley. This leader is stuck. This leader wants to turn right. Cannot see the pedestrian. That's a very common thing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no. That's a very common occurrence. This is a red light lighting. This car has entered this intersection seven seconds into the red light. This vehicle happens to notice the time that it's not blocked. Stops and swerves and prevents this accident. So, all of these cases, this section could provide information. So, the function of the intelligent information is that we move the spatial and temporal uncertainty. Temporal uncertainty is to do with when is the light going to change. Spatial uncertainty is with the right of day. On the potential conflict zone, where the conflict zone is already two potential paths each second, that's a conflict zone. That is offline information, so that can be made available. And if on the pedestrian vehicle, of the presence of other vehicles, bicycles, etc., one can be a blind spot. And one vehicle is a red light body, so that is definitely possible because. Red light violation camera. That camera is triggered, I mean, that the sensor information about 20, 30, 40 across the stopwatch, which measures the speed of the vehicle. And based on that, decides whether the vehicle is likely to stop in the next 30 seconds, the next 30 feet. But if it thinks it's not, it triggers the camera, and that's how it works. So that same triggering of the camera could also warn. The boss I think it can tell you that session. What did they say? Half water, 10% of the power has to be the same session. And so they go by the But there's a single thing in the timing. Okay, so you are these people, there's a light ahead. Right now you see a green, but this intersection will tell you that in five seconds from now your right will turn red and that the direction of traffic flow will be east west. So you could be wrong, right? So some people are inside the screen. Pardon? No, that's a good point. <laughs> that is a good point. That if you're told that slide is going to turn yellow in three seconds, you might decide to speed up. So there you go. This is adverse something. <laughs> adverse adaptation. <laughs> so, but there's the following phenomenon, which is so this is a yellow light now. So the thing you could do, what traffic engineers could do, and they do do it sometimes, in some places, I know in Berkeley, a couple places, where this, this phenomenon, because people know that the next drive is going to be two minutes away, so I'm going to speed up. So then what the traffic engineer wants to do is to, after this yellow will be a red, to increase the duration of the red. Typically the red is three seconds, maybe five seconds, so all these people who are rushing to go through. That you might say it would just be enforced. <laughs> so, but there, there, you could do that. So how do you calculate line zones? So here's the basic idea. You say a trajectory is the route of one particular vehicle. And you define something I call a sky frame, which is a bundle of trajectories, you're all making the same move. You all enter from this lane and that lane and so that's the type. So every 
everybody in the intersection is following some rather than the other, including pedestrians and cyclists and so on. So conflict zone is then where two driveways intersect. That's the back where two objects are going to come together. It's just an indication. So now let's take this particular white trajectory, which wants to make the right turn. It's got seven conflicting zones. That's what they count. Let's see what they are. The black ones are bicycles. So one, two, and three bicycles. That can be the same. The yellow ones are pedestrians. So we take those, we get the park, and then the white ones are other vehicles. So this, if you want to make this safely, you've got to avoid or resolve or somehow or the other and take into account these seven conflicting zones. Yeah. No, no, you have to. So I'm saying that this vehicle, if you're driving, has to avoid seven other objects. Now, what can you do? What can you provide to this vehicle, the driver, could be a pedestrian, could be a to avoid that? So I'm saying that conf the conflicting zones are predefined. Right? So in, if you're an automated vehicle, you could have that on your navigation or just given it to you right? as a map. Now, let's see. So the automated, the intersection can provide you a phase information. Right? So let's see if it just gives you the phase information, what can you get? Suppose that the configuration of all the other vehicles is the way it's like this. So this is your Next to you is Q1, that's a cyclist. There is another V2, which is a pedestrian, and so on. So we have all these other objects with whom you may have you have contacts. This one is another vehicle next to you, which is going to obstruct you. Suppose that the right of way is like this. So you have a red, the other side is a red, and these two are green. So, you know, east west traffic and both direction, east west west east. But all you see is a red. So there are three additional signal configurations which are compatible with your red. Here's one where this vehicle is allowed to go through and allowed to go left. So you have a red, that is a red. If I know that this is the situation, then I don't I ignore this. So these are not allowed to move into my space. Another one is the opposite of that, which is that only the one from the right can turn. If I know what it is, several of the possible conflicts are eliminated. Right? Because I'm assuming that they're all following the law. <laughs> and the, the only one not eliminated is the red light violators. Minus the red light violators. Now, even despite that, knowing that, you're not completely off the hook. Because <clears throat> after you've eliminated what is left for you, supposing it is, this is the configuration of the signal at the bottom of the screen, then you are still left with the blind spots. These vehicles, right? So there's no way to eliminate that unless you get assistance from the intersection that there are some bodies, objects in the blind spot. You know the blind spot because if I know that this year I'm the intersection and then <coughs> there's a, this uh, traffic is stopped at the stop bar, so I know what field of view is included. So, and then if I see that there's objects in that field of view, then I know that there's the blind spot occupied. Somehow or the other, I managed to tell that and convey that to that vehicle or pedestrian or anything. So that would eliminate. So let's go to the Uber zone, Uber scenario. In three lanes, going north south, and three lanes up here. Uber is in the rightmost lane. This vehicle is turning left. So potential conflict zones are 
this vehicle with that, this vehicle with that, this vehicle with the Uber vehicle, that's the red one, and then this vehicle with the pedestrian. So there are four potential conflict zones for that left turn vehicle. <coughs> The driver can see that these two lanes are blocked. So it can get rid of these two. Doesn't know about that one and doesn't know about that one. So that one is still left. That one is still left. The driver said that she could see the walk door block sign. So she can know, she knows that there is no pedestrian crossing by like this. But doesn't know about this. So that is potential conflict zone. Now let's see what are the blind spots. Say you're going here. You have to calculate the blind spot everywhere. So when you come to this place, these two are filled up by park vehicles. So that's the vision zone that I worry about is this angle. And you can see that this part of the far lane is completely blocked by these two. So that's the blind spot. So it's got to be told whether or not there is a vehicle in that black spot. On the other hand, similarly for the Uber vehicle, which is traveling along Tiger Number Three, you can see all this bar. But this is blocked, so you cannot you cannot tell there is a weather or not there's a vehicle. So these two are blind zones, and the only way to prevent the accident, I mean, there's more than one. But one obvious way is to inform the vehicle. There's another way which is you slow down. There's another way you slow down, because you see that you cannot tell whether anybody's here, so you come slower and slower and slower and slower. And then at that point, you begin to see. But that, you get entrapped to the way more problem, which is you're slowing down, slowing down, slowing, because you're uncertain. People behind you are angry, and they're more likely to run into you, but nobody drives that. So nobody drives that they can cautiously approach the intersection and come up and stop until you can see around your obstacles. This, this mobile light that I referred to earlier, we have a paper called uh, safety driving. So they tell you how far you should be from all the other objects and all these kinds of situations. And then when you look at that and you put some numbers that you think are reasonable, realize you would not drive. <laughs> <laughs> it is impossible to drive that way, right? Even at the intersection, you have to have 30 feet in front of you before you can drive. Right? So, so having a fail-safe envelope is just impossible. Right? But if the intersection can communicate to you, there's no need for the safe right? If the communication, if the intersection tells you that this, there's nobody there, then there's no reason for you to be so cautious. This is the problem between safety, that safety driving has for the car vehicles. If you want to be safe, you want to get rid of 94% of the calories, right? That's your car driving. So you have to be super safe. So the only way you know is use game theory and do worst case analysis, and then you find that the distances that you need between you and anybody else is so large. So safety must be combined with some performance that you have to be able to travel at 20 miles an hour, or 25 miles an hour, at some speed. So what you find in automated vehicle research is sort of bifurcated. Right? There's the waivers of this world. We still want to build a fully automated vehicle which can go at normal speeds anywhere and everywhere. And another side of the automated vehicle, you say, I'm not going to go into that high performance. I'm just going to go, I limit my speed, I cannot go faster than 15 miles an hour, and every time they see something, they just stop. This is what you find in, in uh, the work that has only started and we started a company called um, um, It's a golf cart like thing, it goes on the campus, every time they see somebody in front, and it's just going, it's just stop. So safety is guaranteed, and presumably at those speeds, people know this thing is coming, and so they try to avoid it. 
by the Arbor and Arbor and I was in the hospital a couple of years back. <laughs> And my wife came to visit and she said she came to the hospital and she sees this big box traveling on the <laughs> passage. She said, everybody else ignores it and gave it to her and stopped. <laughs> and she didn't know what to do. So she moved around and then it went around her. She said, went to the elevator and the elevator opened and went inside the elevator. And that thing is used to transport medicines and samples throughout the hospital. So this kind of stuff. The next time I happened to her two months ago in Berkeley, there's a little where you have these teeny things going on the road and crossing the streets. And people just, but I'm very, very slow. It's not going to run into you, right? And, I mean, it's going at three miles an hour or something like that. So to achieve safety at that speed, but that's not a transportation solution, right? So, so that's the problem of, of automated vehicles, is how can you guarantee some minimum speed and be safe? So that's what we have. So if we had that automated whatever, then here's how it would look. So this is what it would look to the left turning vehicle. That is what the street would look like to the Uber, and that's from the <laughs> left turning vehicle to the Uber gets message conflict clear, yellow lights are not stopped. So that's what you would do. The red light violation I told you about that vehicle coming seven seconds. So this is an actual accident that took place with an Uber self-driving vehicle. That vehicle over there, the back the van, is the one which violated the red light. This we are taking a movie. We happen to be taking a movie on this intersection to collect data and happen to catch this particular scene. So this vehicle is entering. It has got a green. This vehicle has red. It's seven seconds before it enters. Enter this vehicle, slows down, and turns and avoids the accident. In the case of the uh, Waymo vehicle, it did not slow down, it did not notice it, and there was a crash. So that's the most common red light violation is a Tico. So supposing you buy the story of this at the intersection and you buy the story, it'll cost you ten to thirty thousand dollars an hour, but you're a city and you don't have that much money and you want to decide which intersection should you issue. So that's the rest of this story. So somehow you want to calculate the intersection geometry, you want to map the highways, countries, and line zones, collect crash data, update traffic data, calculate the crash probability, and so on, and then make an assessment and have higher service to low service. The section jump that we can get from open street maps. So open street maps can get all the intersections and the geometry and all the attributes and about 30 attributes for intersection. In California, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have the same thing here. So we have all data of crashes that are reported to the police. So we have collected in San Francisco for over a 10 year period, 5 year period, there's 20,000 crashes. <clears throat> this is what the heat map looks like for which intersections. If you know anything about San Francisco, you expect that's crashes. This is crashes that are normalized by the traffic flow. That is much more constant. This is the normal light, so this is the number of, uh, number of crashes and the number of intersections. <coughs> Ten, you cannot see the numbers, but anyway. Ten percent of the intersections account for fifty percent of the crashes. And <coughs> out here, the <coughs> intersections which account for a huge number of crashes, right? So already you know which crashes, which intersections are more crash prone and which ones are not. Does that follow the floor? Pardon me? Zip's law, does that follow? Zip's law. You know, or could, could be, could be. Yeah. Could be, right? But, uh, I mean, everything like that was like, oh, <laughs> 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 so, we can always say that. 
But you're right. I mean, you should look at the proportion and so on to figure out whether it is or not. But anyway, so so already you can you can limit your search. Now, <clears throat> suppose you've decided whatever it is you want to look at, you want to do any crashes, you want something in section. Then from OSM, or OpenStreetMap, this is the way you, uh, it looks like in OpenStreetMap and intersections. Because in particular intersections happen to be in San Jose, but then that's what it looks like. Let's overlay this on a Google Map. And <clears throat> so that's what the intersection looks like. For Now you can take that open street map and you can draw all the guideways. You can take the guideways to be a guideway is you have an approach and an exit, and you follow the center line of the base <coughs> and the reasonable curvature with it. So you get all these. So these are the possible guideways in that particular intersection, which is a little complicated. It's got, got two rail lines. Street, street. Um, or light traffic, light rail, light rail on, on the top. Uh, <coughs> and the red ones are pedestrian crossways, the green ones are bicycle lanes, and the blue ones are. So that's the guideways. So you can see the amount of conflicts, the number of conflicts in the place. Now let's focus on one of them, one particular <coughs> So we're going to focus on this left turn. Ignore all the other guideways except the ones which have conflicts with that one, right? And so we find all these things where the conflicts are many, many conflicts. Let's see, questions, Then you can say, okay, there's a conflict between that one and that bicycle. You can put yourself somewhere in here and see what are the possible obstructions which would prevent you from finding out whether the cycle is bicycle is coming. So you find this is the obstruction. And you can see what so then you know that this is a possible blind zone for that vehicle making a left turn and that blind zone in due to cycles. It comes from possible cycles. You know where you should instrument it with the camera, but something else. Right? So you can systematically cover all the possible conflict zones and all the possible approaches and all the possible points and figure out where the instrument is going. Next thing to do is to calculate the intersection. So this is a difficult problem, I think. So I'm going to calculate the intersection crash probability. This is the Uber like scene. But instead of having a vehicle going this way, have a pedestrian and this vehicle or this vehicle, like a common situation. Pedestrian is obscured by these very common situation. So you want to just assign, I don't know why you want to assign it, suppose you want to do that. What is the likelihood of a crash in that particular scenario? So let's take a peak hour. Within the peak hour, look at the cycle. Right? When this one has, uh, this is red, and this one has uh, green. So the right turn on red accident is the probability of the right that somebody is trying to make the right turn. On red. During peak hour, chances are there's somebody there, almost for sure. So that might be more. What's the probability of a block view? If it's peak hour, lots of traffic. That's pretty hard. Multiply by the probability that a pedestrian is in fact crossing during its green phase. That could be quite high. If you make a rough estimate, that number, in my estimate, turned out to be pretty high. Uh, the chances of there being a crash between the pedestrian and that right turning vehicle is very high. Condition But I don't think that's a realistic estimate. And the reason I think it is not realistic and it's too high a number is because pedestrians are very agile. 
at the last second they can stop you and the vehicle can't stop you. Right? But if they are doing this, looking at the cell phone, that probability goes down. And so I think this probability goes up. And that may explain why in San Francisco now, I mean, the pedestrian fatality rate is shot up. Anyway, so we could calculate this time numbers and decide where this is going to happen. So we want to generate these hazardous scenarios. And so this is what we are doing now, this uh, software story. So we have open speed maps. We focus across the intersection in two parts. So we focus on a particular intersection, we build the driveways and the time zones. And then we create a scenario, which is a car on a particular driveway, etc., etc. Et and uh, uh, students of Sandeep Asia are building this, uh, have this uh, program called Scenic, which uh, places vehicles and objects and so on on these driveways with some random perturbations. Then you create a scene now with these things. EBOTS is another simulation package which animates these, so you have to give dynamics to all the objects in here, and you get a scenario simulation. The auto companies are interested, or the AD companies are interested in so-called edge cases. Edge cases are difficult cases, and they want to generate them so that they can test whether their algorithms We're trying to do something different. So, as I said, the automated vehicles which have an accident, the safety driver has to file a narrative. If you have an accident, you have to file a report with the DMV. So, this is a narrative of one crash on the town of the vehicle. The green things in green are, are keywords that we're going to use to produce a police report. Police report doesn't have this full story behind, right? It just says that vehicle is over here, that vehicle is over there, they crashed in this particular way, it was a head-on or a crash, etc. Right? So the police report is very, very sparse. And that we can get for, as I said, 20,000 crashes. So we have the green stuff for 20,000 crashes. What we want to build is a scenario that is to do the narrative with all the black stuff is erased for these 20 so that you can understand how what, what's the commonality among the certain questions. So what we want to do is to start with this narrative, abstract a police report, which is the screen stuff, and see if we can reconstruct that particular crash or build a story. Or build as many stories that are compatible and as many black scenarios that are compatible with the green description. So that's the actual place with that crash place. So <coughs> the vehicle is going that way. It's the bicycle. And so this is what the police report might look like. Section of View Street and California Street, the 80 was on the View Street going north and stopped. So the 80 is going north and stopped. Bicyclists on California Street going west. See, only this one and that one. This has a stop sign and that is a stop sign and these have no stop signs. And the path of collision is harder because they don't. <laughs> Bicyclists are <laughs> that. Considered legal things, right? So, whether well, it's legal, legal bicycles, right? even though actually it's a broadside, so if it were legal, it would have been classified. Maybe, maybe a bullet by a tree in the right room. So, we take this kind of description and we see, of this kind of summary, and we see how many configurations, initial configurations, it's a, it's a each building problem, right? I know the end state. The end state is the car hit the bicycle, and this particular, and the bicycle was oriented that way, the car is oriented that way. I don't know what is the preceding 10 seconds that led to that, right? And it turns out there's more than one plausible reconstruction. So 
it's like the, we call it the prime basis. You're trying to make the string cleaner. Anyway, so that's what you're trying to do. And so turns out even that particular example, you can easily construct three to four plausible scenarios leading to that action. Now, In my view, there's no particular credibility attached just to that narrative, just because it happens to be the safety driver the way it won't be. Every, state, every report I've seen invariably seems to exempt the safety driver from fault. Right? There's always it's the other guy didn't see me, or didn't, etc. So there's no particular credibility. A lawyer would take my reconstruction and make an argument in front of the jury as legally possible. Of them, right? Because you don't have any other data except the reason. So that's where we are now, our current research. So where do we go from here? So you want to do city scale in section characterization, use the STIMS database to identify <coughs> the section accidents, and obtain possible uh, narratives, and so on. And on way of inter multi-agent dynamics of the intersection is crucial. The one thing which is missing in the narratives is what do the two parties, the two parties, what do they think is going on? And how are they reacting in terms of what they think? They all have a, I presume, they're carrying out some image of the other party. Right? And clearly the, the images are inconsistent. Then the question is, vision zero, I, in my view, is, is very expensive. Infrastructure modification is extremely expensive. Virtually every vision zero effort involves elimination of a lane. Eliminating a lane, if it's a two lane in each direction, then eliminating half of the peak capacity. So the immediate mobility and that's there 24 hours, whether or not there's any traffic, right? Whether it's a concrete solution. So, whereas this vision, this other kind of stuff is much more flexible, and you can increase the safety envelope, increase the safety envelope. So, I would push for intelligent intersections as a way of, of much cheaper and maybe more effective addition 